Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Thank you for joining us today on Adeptus On Air. Um, Davina, welcome. I would love to get started and have you introduce yourself and a little bit about Element Apothic and what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Element Apothic and um, really excited to be here today to have this conversation with you and opportunity to share more about what we're doing, but really helping you know entrepreneurs and founders kind of understand the importance of strategy and how do you actually start something and turn it into a successful business? So I'm excited for this conversation. And Element Apothic itself, we're um, an award-winning global wellness uh, brand, um, beauty brand focused on really elevating the space and finding that market between kind of conventional and alternative medicine, plant-based medicine, uh, nature and science, and coming together to create products that have true function uh, for the customers that are using those products, taking you know education um, as well as the innovations in science to bring products forward to these uh, customers. That is an incredible place that needs a lot of support. And maybe let's go into one of the areas that you mentioned around alternative and plant-based wellness. And that is an area that, that still requires a lot of education, a lot of handholding for consumers. Um, can you maybe explain at a high level first, what does that category represent? And what does that mean to you and your approach to bringing those uh, options, wellness options to life and, and available for consumers? I mean, you know, as we think about it, it really is almost like an integrative healing category, right? Of um, thinking about how do you integrate all of these different functionalities of ancient wisdom of plant-based medicine, like for example, cannabis has been around for thousands of years and bring that to light with the insights that they have with modern medicine and science and even, you know, the idea of isolating specific ingredients and in plants to bring together medicine and, and whole plant medicine. Um, and so that's kind of how we, we kind of look at this category and how we specifically approach it is exactly that there are these remedies that have existed for, for hundreds, for thousands of years, almost going back to our roots and looking about how uh, medicine even started. Um, and then though looking at these specific ingredients that now have been studied through science to be very functionally specific in, in terms of how they can help people. But without education, people don't really understand that, like the endocannabinoid system, for example. I mean, you can sit in a room and say that, and unless you're in the cannabis space, very few people have any idea about what the endocannabinoid system is. And, and oftentimes will even challenge you saying it's hokey and somebody made it up because they didn't teach it in medical school. Well, they're teaching in a medical school. There's now cannabis science, uh, you know, comp, uh, platforms and colleges that are actually teaching about this. Um, but without the knowledge of how these systems work internally and how we work synergistically with a lot of these plant-based ingredients, people, people don't have any idea and they've trusted a system that oftentimes has been led by, you know, prohibition and, and things and big pharma to discourage people from looking at these ingredients that are now being recognized to actually be helpful. So let's talk about some of those ingredients. You, know, you mentioned your endocannabinoid system, specifically cannabis and, and the myriad of research that's needed to understand, you know, the human interaction with the cannabis plant and, and everything around that. But plant medicine's really wider than that. Um, yeah. You know, some of it's based on the culture or region you're from, and that's your definition of plant medicine if you're from South America versus from mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. And so what, what's your personal experience with that? And, and, you know, what has been indigenous to you and your culture when you say plant medicine and, and that generational handoff and, and what is your connection to that? And then maybe explain the broader version of that, whether it's psychedelics or food as functional ingredients in plant medicine and things of that nature. 
Yeah, I mean, personally, for me, I had the opportunity to grow up around plant based medicine, my father's native Hawaiian and, and for the culture, oftentimes, you know, plants were what was there. I mean, you didn't go to the doctors and early, you know, native Hawaiian days and say, prescribe me something you had to really turn to the foods and plants that were around you to support the conditions that you had. Um, oftentimes, though, exposed with other cultures and communities that were mixed into there and and bringing their plant-based medicine into the fold too, to, um, to explore that as well. And, and cannabis, for example, has been around ever since I was young. My dad was a Vietnam veteran also in the Hawaiian culture. Cannabis is, is very yeah. accepted. And so, I mean, I have baby pictures with cannabis plants and, you know, always understood, you know, it, it was never, let's go to the doctor and figure out what you needed. It's let's try this remedy and concoction first. And then, if that doesn't work, then let's go to the doctor and see what might be able to happen for you. And, and so, and I had that exposure through my whole life, at least on my dad's side, on, on my mom's side, very different. You know, she went to school to be a nurse. She was a physician's assistant. So uh, pharmaceuticals were like her go-to, but even now, you know, she's recognized the value of plant-based ingredients. And, and you start to look at some of these other alternatives, like psilocybin and, you know, some of the other things that are coming in and even whole foods as people look at like ancient grains and really understanding how our system needs almost, you know, these types of products to help just get us back to what we should be. I mean, our body's capable of absolutely amazing things. We've evolved over millions of years, plants and, and these ingredients have evolved over millions of years. There probably is some synergies that exist between us, which is why all of this works. And now obviously the endocannabinoid system is one of those things that's proven. Yes, we work synergistically with plants and, and that's within terpenes. Terpenes exist outside of the cannabis plant. I mean, why does, you know, why have people taken peppermint for nausea and, you know, lemon to help with this? And then you start to understand the terpene profiles that make up things. It's like, oh, the grandma's old soup recipe, <laughs> adding in these ingredients wasn't necessary because grandma knew it's because these plant-based ingredients work to actually provide the function that we need. And, and I think that's really something for people to, to start to understand as they start to break down plants and it becomes not so scary. Like cannabis isn't this new scary product. It's, it's really looking about these things that make up the plants to help our bodies function the way that they they're capable of doing. We, we seem to underestimate our ability as humans to take something that naturally works and fits a real need and change it to something that complicates what our system was built to process and understand and work with. There's a natural way. Mm -hmm. And we then sort of spin that and twist that to fit this designed way of life we want to have versus looking back and having this level of trust. Yeah. trust in what was you know natively not just grown but existing in these parts of the world whether it be Hawaii or Brazil or the rainforest or wherever that may be and say well these plants are native and indigenous to this region for the people of that region and possibly for others but definitely for that and the, and the benefits that come from that what is your thought around that relationship, that trust relationship, because when you talk about plant medicine and talk about food and saying, well, we just, there's some trial and error here. Mm -hmm. There is a trust with your scientist in that process. You know, the same way you have a hypothesis, you prove it or disprove it. And then you get to this, um, you know, truth, if you will, in the scientific process uh, or, or some sort of um, way about that. But in, traditional sort of cultures it's not western medicine it's more of an eastern philosophy of having that connection with the plants with what is the medicine and also being much more aligned with people you know so even western medicine physicians some have a very eastern approach to mm -hmm. understanding what people's ailments really are yeah. not just asking them what hurts but understanding maybe what's happening in their life that's causing that pain or maybe cause that injury. That's not just something that you treat with acetaminophen. Yeah. You know, there might be something else underlying that. So maybe talk a little bit about 
that process of, of trusting the plants and trusting the people that are educating on the plants and maybe how that ties into developing what you put to market with Element Apothic because now you have to build a trust relationship with your customer. Right. You know, that, that, that consumer that's going to come in and say, why, why would I trust a brand to bring me plant medicine? And, yeah. and maybe if you can speak that, because it's, I, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I yeah, know, I mean, I think you're right, right? Like we've, we've grown up and, and it's been generationally now in terms of the way and who people trust to tell them what they need and how they need to do it. And, and that authority has been established in various capacities with doctors and pharmacists and and, you know, scientists and lawyers, you know, right? Like we live in this culture of like, these are the people that know when we need to trust them, politicians, whatever, whoever that might be. And, and I do think though, there's almost an awakening of, of going back to how communities and societies develop to think about, you know, it is, it is the medicine man that's in his, you know, that's sitting there and really understands the synergies of these, these roots and these ingredients that everybody trusted to go to. And, and I think that got lost a little bit along the way as we tried to categorize people into specific roles and how um, those roles are viewed. At least that's my perspective where, where that, you know, my great aunt, for example, created the basis of our products and, and she really read about plant-based medicine and Eastern culture and Ayurveda and really looked at the understanding of these ingredients of these thousands of years of information and, and had to trust in the knowledge that's there and had to trust in, in um, yeah, that there might be some trial and error, but there's trial and error in regular everyday pharmaceuticals. I mean, you don't know what's going to work. They test out different things. Some people take one of something. Some people have to take three of something like that still exists. But I think the idea is where do we trust the authority and, and who are we trusting? Are we looking to the, the scientists? Are we looking to these plant-based experts? Are we looking to, I mean, even pharmacists, like I didn't even know farm, you know, doctors have one semester of pharmacology, but they're the ones who are prescribing medications and, and the pharmacists have their whole school about understanding pharmacology and how the body works. So, so who are we really trusting to, to think about the products that we're incorporating? And I do think though, it's important to have that um, expertise and leadership as you're thinking about creating these products, because it is just the way that people believe in things. And so having a scientist, having a medical expertise, having pharmacists really looking at the components of these products, but you know, like everything, I think there's better for you ways to do things. A lot of the better for you ways is just going back to the ways things used to be when we used to have to care about even packaging and sustainability. If you, if you lived in a village, you had to think about, you know, you couldn't have all this piles of stuff accumulating. You reuse things, you know, where you looked at each of the, like you said, the surrounding plants and okay, maybe in this culture, we need this extra vitamin because of the sun exposure and, oh, wow, it's actually this protection exists in this plant to provide us some skin protection. So it is also trusting in like the environment and what's been provided to us through the evolution of our development, like this, these stuff or whatever your beliefs are, like there's plants that were put here to help us. Right. And, and how do we evolve and utilize this? But let's, let's also kind of think about what, where trust is being put and, and who's really out there trying to help us to solve some of these issues, not just mask them which I think what a lot of, of people look for now is like, I just want to mask it. I, I used CBD and I didn't feel anything. Well, yeah, it takes time. <laughs> like it's okay. not a mask and you're instantly not going to feel better. Like everything takes time. Exercise takes time. You know, just it's a shift of mindset that has to happen. I think I'm, you're, we're starting to see it, but it's a continual process of reevaluating how we actually go about taking care of ourselves. Yeah, there's the term personalized medicine. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because as much as we use that term, that's a fairly broad term for cohorts of people to be personalized around versus really what it is, is everyone's an individual. And each yeah. one of us has a really unique relationship with all of our inputs in our lives. And, you know, it, it's hard to use what is the baseline average to what works for us. And each one of us has something that's different. You know, yeah. some people like stevia, some people don't, well, you can generalize that a little bit, but 
Some people have an re- allergic reaction to it. Some people don't. And you can start to get down into the nuance of it's an individual experience with everything we're doing. And that trust relationship ultimately is built around our knowledge and our understanding of ourselves, but then also our knowledge and understanding of others around us that we're trusting to give us some of those inputs. So how do you in, so you're, you're a leader and you're a founder of Element Apothic, a co-founder of Element Apothic and using that, that concept of trust in the context of building a startup and, and where you are in that process, you've been building a team around you and collaborating with not just your internal team members, but also your third-party team members and partners. Talk a little bit about um, what you view as the role of collaboration at Element Apothic and and really in your life as it relates to developing what you've been developing and, and your experience and what efforts you've made to ensure that you're building these trust relationships, that you can collaborate in a way that is most effective to support your goals and objectives for Element Apothic. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, for, for me, thinking about Element Apothic, it's, it's been absolutely critical to get us where we're at, to have this uh, layer of trust around us in building, because, you know, for me to think I know everything and I'm great at everything is, is crazy, right? Like, I can't possibly think that. And I've seen the startups, I've been in e-commerce and tech for a while where, where there is sometimes that mentality that exists. And yeah, there is someone who may come up with the idea, but how do they implement it? How do they market it? Who has deeper expertise in terms of even customer service and internal systems and all of these things? It, it, it takes a whole, it's like building your puzzle, right? Like how does each piece fit together? And so um, I think that that really does though lend itself to trust because if you bring people in that know what they're doing, for example, when we were creating our products, we had these amazing formulations. My great aunt had been doing these products for 10 years. She helped hundreds and hundreds of people um, improve the quality of their life. I also know though that we didn't have the, the trust and the thought leadership of a pharmacist or a medical advisor to come in and say, hey, I've reviewed these products. I mean, our medical advisor, chief medical advisor is a triple certified gastrointestinal doctor and studies a gut microbiome. It's like, I need to make sure these are actually safe in somebody's bodies. And I want your authority to say that because people are going to trust that as, as we spoke about before. Um, Dr. Swathi, who came in as a co-founder and is our chief scientific officer, is an integrative pharmacist and cannabis educator. And so it was looking at, the pieces of like, what do I know? And what do I, and what do I not know? Um, I'm not, I don't have deep marketing expertise. And, you know, so it's like, we look at these things and the relationships of the people that, that I felt like we needed around us to actually build a company. Cause on my own, I would just be a small, like mom and pop shop, essentially, you know, selling things. But I also recognize we have the opportunity to impact so many more people, but to do that, what do, who do we need around us? We need someone with operational expertise. We need someone with understanding of legal compliance so we don't get in trouble in the things that we um, say, like I said, marketing and sales expertise. So um, I, I think it's really important as uh, founders and, and entrepreneurs to really think about that. And I also do know, you know, a lot of people don't have the financial means to be able to bring on this extensive team we did. And, and so um, there's ways to bring on advisors and support systems of people that are trusted in what they do that really do want to give back and help make a difference to support good causes and good products that are getting launched out there. And then in that environment, now you're bringing a lot of people together. So how do you work through collaboration of those different experts, advisors, team members, um, And how do you foster that environment of collaboration? I mean, I think first fostering the the environment of collaboration really starts with who's helping to lead those efforts. Because some people say they want a collaborative environment, but when you're sitting in a meeting with them and talking to them, that's not the case at all. And, And oftentimes, you know, I've seen those types of companies I used to do startup consulting, like they don't often do so well. I mean, maybe there's some, you know, 
examples where that's not the case, right? Like some big companies that we all know <laughs> where there's some very dominated leaders, but but underneath them, I imagine those teams very much are collaborate collaboration in terms of being able to get done what those leaders want to get done. So I do think it starts at at the top of just having this mindset of understanding your strengths and weaknesses and really what else do you need to bring to the table for success? But in terms of fostering that, you know, there's ways of really understanding who you're bringing to the table, what knowledge and skill set do they bring and, and sitting everyone at a table with an equal voice to really hear how everybody can help, you know, whether it's positioning or marketing or, or some strategy type planning and, and be open to different opinions and different perspectives. I think that is really important, the willingness to be open, because without that, there's no collaboration, um, but also bringing in people that have that same mindset where they also look at things in a way that together we can build better than me on my own is, you know, is stronger. So it, it, it's a couple things, but, you know, there's ways to harness that in meetings, you know, there's great collaborative tools like Slack and, um, but it, but it still starts again at the top of how much information are you sharing? How transparent are you with what your goals and your processes are to even allow people to have input into any type of collaborative process? Yeah, you, you touch on a great point there, you know, being open, and, and that can have a lot of meanings in, in the sense of being open minded, open to other people's experiences. And that it sounds like that is a core value of, you know, yourself to just be open to the things that you may not know, that you may not have authority. In. And even when you have authority, be open to someone else's perspective, because they come from a different place and may offer you a new window into how to think about something. Yeah. What would you say are those core values for you? You know, you talk about transparency, you talk about being open, you know, does that lead to a more collaborative environment for you? And, and, and what are those core values for you and, and for Element Apothic and how do you share those? Yeah. I mean, we, you, you've talked about trust a couple of times and, and for me, the way, at least for myself, like some of my core values is like, I want to be a trusted person. I want to be a good person. I think we inherently want to be good people. Well, at least most people want to be good people. But, but what are those qualities of trustworthiness, right? Because you, you can't just say, trust me. Um, you have to be compassionate. You have to be open. You have to be um, collaborative. You have to be honest, you have to think about um, your place. And, and I think part of it comes from also culturally, like the indigenous cultures, you know, there's an idea of your responsibility is not just for you today, but of representation of your past uh, ancestors, yourself and future generations, like 10 generations ahead of you. And so thinking about how do you, you know, as a company even, or as a person, like, okay, if I have a responsibility for for not just myself, but all of these things, what kind of person do I want to be? Because I'm, I am, and this is my family name, and I'm representing something that's way bigger than, than I exist as a person. And as a company, the same thing, we're representing something that's way bigger than us. This plant-based medicine is so much bigger than we exist as people. And then though, how do we get people to trust us in terms of what we're actually bringing out there. And you have to stick to your word, right? You can't be like saying one thing and doing something else. You have to be transparent, unfortunately, almost extra transparent because there's been this idea that so much has been hidden, like on labels, even from people or ingredients are not even put on labels. People are hidden under natural ingredients or flavors or things like that. So it's like, what am I even taking in my body? Um, but for me personally, it's just it's really living this idea of me as a person is representative of what was before me and what continues to come after me and, and what kind of legacy do I want to leave behind as the type of person I am and putting those same values then into your company, which I often think gets missed sometimes by founders of like, I'm a good person. These are the things I care about. But then you look at some of the pillars of their companies and the way they operate their business and and it doesn't always align. And then they wonder why customers aren't trusting them and, you know, what's happening. So I think it's really to be clear. And maybe my way isn't all, maybe my pillars aren't all the best, right? So who else is the founding team? Who else is supporting us to say, hey, these are the things that are going to matter to to our customers, whether you're a service provider or a, a product company. And, and what values do we want them to be? 
to hold accountable for. Cause we all come from, like you said, different places with a different perspective on things. Yeah. It's really interesting that you, you brought um, the understanding of even indigenous cultures and, and community and trusting everyone's role within the community in, in the same way that you have to trust everyone's role within the business and, and building that, that trust as a community and collaborating as a community is really what allows for sustainability long-term, you know, and everyone has not just their role, but they understand what everyone else is doing. They can collaborate on that. And, and that community can continue to grow, you know, the same way you mentioned as a startup, you may be an individual founder, you might be a co-founder, you may have a founding team of a few people, but every step you go, you're building that community. And it's not just the internal team you're developing. It's the community of your consumer base and, and continue to extend that. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense that your values that drive you and, and the ref, the indigenous references to you, indigenous cultural references to you come through in your business and your practices and the way you collaborate and work with your partners and, and team members. Um, and I think it, it, it's great to hear you say that. And I think more uh, entrepreneurs should really think about that relationship. Um, you know, with their teams and, and also with their, their consumers. Um, I don't know if you had anything else that you wanted to, to add on that. I mean, it's a, it's the idea too, right? When you have kids, it's like, it takes a village to raise this, uh, this child and, and for people yeah. to think that it doesn't take a village to raise a, a brand. I mean, it, it really is every, there's, there's, like you said, it's such a broader community and there's people that fill very specific roles or people that fill broader roles. There's customer experiences. I mean, there's so much that fits into this village per se. And so thinking about it kind of from, from that perspective and, you know, for example, building element apothic, it wasn't like where we are today, because where we are today, okay, our, a, cu a couple of us are fine, but, but what are we building for our future? Let's look at three years, five years, 10 years from now, what do we want to be and thinking about that from the beginning of what type of support do I need today to actually help get me in this place I want to be. Don't wait till you're like, oh my gosh, I should have had them already. You know, there's the opportunity to start thinking bigger in terms of what you're trying to accomplish if that's what your plans are anyways. Yeah. So let's go there. What What is your vision for Element Apothic? Or, you know, you probably had one coming into this process and, and you, you've now been, you know, building for some time and, and things may change. The, obviously our, our, socioeconomic environment and geopolitical environment changes constantly. And, and we're, we're sort of living through this and learning as we're going through. What is your vision for Element Apothic? And, and how do you see yourself getting there? Who do you want to help? How do you want to help them? Three, five years, just, you know, where, where do you see this going? I mean, I, I look to Element Apothic to be I mean, we're now moving international, which is exciting and something actually from the beginning that was the goal, right? My great aunt's wish when she handed over these products were to take them from the kitchen to the world. And that is something that I hold very close to me and, and something that I won't ever back down from. Like we can really help people with these products, um, including my mom and my grandma use our products. I, I see how they impact them. So to really be this kind of global integrative healing organization to help bring these types of products to market to help educate people around why products like this work. And, you know, right now we're focused on cannabinoid based products, but that's not to say that we won't look outside of the cannabinoid space because we also work with, you know, 30, 40 other plant-based ingredients like our lotion, our face serum, and even our tinctures all have other really relevant ingredients on their own could stand as an individual product without having these ingredients. And then as there's medicinal mushrooms and so many things that come to play where it really is kind of looking at this blend of modern medicine and ancient wisdom to bring um, alternative uh, products to, um, to consumers and continuing to build on that global presence because in a lot of these other cultures, wellness has often been looked at from this mindset of how do you uh, bring a lot of the cultural knowledge of products that have been used and use them in everyday um, life. But then the introduction of modern medicine sometimes had, had that law. So how do we remind people um, globally that we can turn to these types of products to help them? Hmm. And, and so 
you know, very um, needed and yet lofty um, aspirations to, you know, address some of these things, not just in a, in a local community, but in a global community um, with so many diverse views and experiences and that. And so how do you get there? You know, what are the things that you can operationalize in your business today that actually help you to, A, educate and not educate, but share with your team, you know, what that, that vision is and the goals that you have, but then also operationalize that because there's, there's a lot there mm-hmm. to get from startup brand, you know, going from your, your, it's your great aunt, her recipes and your grandmother. Yeah. My great aunt, your, your great aunt's recipes in the kitchen to bringing that to the world. And, and that's a, you know, that's, and you've done it already. So, so first of all, congratulations for all the success to date. And I know, um, you know, that's not the accolade that you're really looking for. It is to really help people. And so how do you do that at scale? How do you help individuals one-on-one at scale? And how does Element of Poplic do that? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it's complicated, right? It's not an easy thing. And and two, as you grow to not lose sight of what your <laughs> intentions were and, and how do we reach the individual consumer? Because with products like this, it very much is a one-on-one experience, as we talked about earlier. Um, and people need hand-holding and consultations. It's not just you put out this video and everyone's like, oh, I know exactly what to do with these products. Right. Um, but really it, it is, you know, like we just went through a strategy planning session. Um, it's really important to really keep light of what your goals are from a high level. But then how do you, like you said, operationally break these down into tactical goals that are manageable for the team and being also conscious of who you actually have on the team to get this done because oftentimes, I mean, we've been guilty of it. You have these big lofty goals and we're going to accomplish all these things. And you're like, we don't have the manpower to actually do these things. So it's really important to really think about the resources that you have. That's what we're going through now is the exercise as we look to our planning for the next couple of years of where we want to be. How do we actually get there in a way that makes sense in a way that's financially manageable um, because we all have financial constraints as we're growing as well as a you know, people power perspective to, to accomplish this, but not losing sight, like you said, of our goal is really to help people. And so, you know, how do we offer operationally uh, manage one-on-one consultations with customers when we're, you know, at some point going to have thousands of customers, what things do we need to build in to make sure that our core values and principles along the way don't get lost and we don't get stuck as just another big company that just cares about money. So, there's a lot of things that we're thinking about in terms of how do we manage that? How do we have personalization as we continue to, to grow? What type of people and resources do we need to make that happen? What type of, of financial backing do we need to actually continue to grow this business like this with, yeah, like you said, pretty lofty goals and, and we're there, we're starting, but we still have a long ways to go to get to where I'm hopeful that, or I feel like we're capable of getting to. Yeah. And in that, you mentioned a little bit of, of working within the, the constraints of the resources you have. And maybe talk a little bit about, about when you identify the resources you may not have internally, what your process is to find them externally. You know, your advisors in, in different technical areas, whether that be, again, in the kitchen, out in the field or in, in the boardroom. Yeah. I mean, I think it's that like, I mean, I remember when my aunt was like, I'm handing over these products to you. I was like, oh my gosh, what do I not know about all of this? And what do I know? And it it really is almost doing that like internal or with your team SWOT analysis of, you know, what are our strengths, weaknesses? What are our threats? What do, what do we have no idea what what is half, you know, what the market is like? Um, And just being really honest with yourselves. Cause what I have seen in, in other times is people will will almost boast what they know and their knowledge and their experience because they, they're they afraid of letting people know maybe they don't know something and they don't have that knowledge and information. So it's really important for whether you're an individual founder or a team to, to kind of take a step back and say, what is what is our actual skill set? What are we good at? And then have a board that's like, here's all the things that we maybe know a little, but we're not great at. And then start to explore, like for me, even Dr. Swathi happened over a LinkedIn request because I saw posts that she had. And I was like, we need a cannabis educator, an expert 
and pharmacists, I think that's what we're really missing to be able to provide that expertise on into the products and education. And so I, I was out there like hunting, you know, like who is really good at this? Also, who do I uh, value their, um, you know, what type of person they are? And, and it takes a little bit of research to really understand that, that I've made mistakes, like not everybody that, that I thought we would be working with, we're working with today. Um, and then those are those hard decisions and conversations to also say, okay, this, we thought this person was good, or maybe they were good for the first six months and really helped us with X, Y, Z, but now we've grown and we need somebody else who can help us with this. But really looking who's out there, asking people, talking to people, that's what I've done. Like, who, who do you go to for this? Who do you trust? Um, even in the industry, you know, who's doing certain things? How are they helping? And start to build out um, what those resources look like, whether we could bring them on today in advisor capacity or, or holding a place for them in the future when we have the ability to bring them on to support those positions. Yeah, you, you kind of brought up a word there, which is which is interesting as you were finishing your thought about how you look for advisors and, and think about what your needs are. Um, and, and that was fear. And fear is an interesting motivator for all of us in a both personal and professional setting. What is for you, was there a time that you had a fear about even getting started with Element Apothic? And how did you overcome that? And, and what are you doing now? to address maybe some other fears or anxieties, whatever you want to call them that you have today? Yeah, I mean, fear is real. Like it impacts people in ways that they have no idea. And for sure it's impacted me. I mean, I, I remember saying, okay, I'm going to take these formulations. And I thought, what the heck am I, <laughs> am I doing thinking that I could do this? The farm bill had passed. I was walking through the CBD expo just before COVID hit and there was all these manufacturers saying they could help bring your CBD brand to market, you know, market launch products in 10 minutes or something like that. I was like, Oh my God. Like my, I remember my walking down the aisle on each new row is my heart beating thinking, what are we doing and how are we going to accomplish this goal that I've now taken responsibility for? Um, but it's again, being confident of like, okay, I know what we're doing and the products that we have are, are really going to have an impact and make a difference. And we'll surpass most of the products that are in this, uh, in this room um, here, but um, yeah, fear is, is still impacts me. I mean, there's times where you have that imposter syndrome, like, what am I, I'm standing up here, I'm doing this interview. I remember being on a panel recently at an event and thought, well, how, how come I'm up here, you start questioning yourself. Am I capable of leading this? Why are people trusting me to follow me? And then it's remembering like, I've got this, I'm okay. This is all of the things I've done to get myself here. And I deserve to be up here having um, these conversations, but yeah, we're going out for fundraising and, and building our team. And, and each of these conversations, each time it's like fear comes in, like, will they fund us? Do we have the best idea? And and someone just told me the best thing. It's like, you might, you know, there's people that have got funded off of writing ideas on a postcard. Like they've gotten a lot of money off of writing ideas and they'll go up there and say, I have the best idea and you believe me and write a check. Maybe it's a little bit different today in the investor world, but still remembering like we have more than just an idea on a postcard. We've actually created something that stands and has helped numerous customers and remembering that. But fear is, it's always present. I think it's just a matter of how we manage it. And the other thing is fear is almost the same thing as excitement. So, you know, when we're excited about things, we're happy, like sometimes we're sweating, we're like building that anticipation and fear represents itself in often similar ways. So instead of sometimes having fear of like, how do I position this as, yeah, it's fear, but I'm excited for what I'm actually bringing to this conversation. You know, it's, it's a great point, and I'm happy you brought that up because I, I was going to say it's so interesting how the physiological response to fear and excitement are almost identical. Mm -hmm. The butterflies in your gut that that's, you know, your, your skin, your, your hair raising on your skin, you know, it's, it is that um, odd situation where there, there's that duality. Well, is it a fear or is it an excitement? Mm -hmm. And then as a human processing that, can we learn to turn those fears into energy and excitement. And then once we do that, that mindset shift 
how do we then actualize it? Mm -hmm. And so what have you done throughout your career personally and, and professionally to think about that? You know, not, not a lot of people would have said what you said about, you know, fear and excitement in the same sentence. And I'm, I'm really happy that you did because I think it speaks to your ability to, to be present and be grounded. And so many leaders are not that right now. Um, you know, they have a script, they're going off of it. They've seen someone else do something, then I should just do the same thing. You know, someone posted on TikTok, so I got to replicate that, you know, but, but you have that presence to understand that there is an ability to shift how something may impact you to something that is very positive. What, what led you to that realization? What are the tools that you have um, to, to kind of shift from that fear-based model to that, this is exciting. Now, how do I harness that energy and do something with it? You know, I mean, for me, you know, I mean, I think it actually goes back to when I was a kid and we had a hard life. My mom was a single mom and my dad was involved. He was in Hawaii, but life wasn't easy for us. And, and there could have been a lot of fears. I think my mom showed me, you know, I don't know how she managed, you know, being a young mom with three kids doing the things she did. She went back to school. And, and so, you know, there were many nights I mean, she'd be up there worried, like, how am I even going to make ends meet and pay for groceries. I would overhear conversations and, and I would just see her do it. Like she would just take care of it. And there was fear there, but it had to be resolved. And, and she couldn't let that fear take her down. And that was something for me growing up that I just always had that mindset, you know, even in school, like I pushed myself, I, I knew if I did well, that I could, I wouldn't have to have those struggles growing up that maybe my life would be a little bit less fearful of worrying about how I was going to get food on the table for my family. So I think that that was something that was just the way that I evolved in seeing how my family had to make ends meet and to manage that. Um, but then also in my professional career, it was similar. I mean, I remember the first time I was doing an all employee meeting and I was a very uh, young senior manager and um, I always felt like I was getting um, evaluated on my, what my performance was. And, and I remember stepping up on stage and there was hundreds of employees and that fear set in and I was like, okay, fearful. I can't let it overcome me. This is my opportunity to say, hey, I deserve to be up here on stage and start to shift that fear into, I mean, I still had butterflies in my stomach and my legs were shaking behind the podium, but I was like, I'm so excited that I get this opportunity to, to be up here. So it really is a, a shift of, I mean, fear is there because it's, because we evolve like that. We had to have fear to be able to get to where we're at. That fear isn't always justified today because there's means and ways that we don't have to live like that. So how do you take that and, and shift that into being more of an empowering moment? Like for me, I'm like, fear means, okay, this is something I have to overcome and challenge it. Like I said, partly probably because of how I grew up, but then also understanding how that played out in my own life and opportunities I had to make that adjustment. Yeah. And, and also holding it in, in the sense that it's interesting, the curiosity of what that feeling is coming from, you know, where does it, A, is it fear? And, and B, where is it coming from? That, that curiosity to really sit with that and understand it and then be able to turn it into something positive like you have is, is really incredible. So, and, you know, obviously something that evolves over time to your point as a species, you know, we, we had to learn how to run from animals that would actually kill us. And so right. now we have a car, so it might not be near that animal or whatever else we've done to, you know, pave the world over um, in, in many habitats. But what um, you talked a little bit about this, and, and I think it's, it's coming out in, in what you're, you're talking about, learning and identifying your personal strengths as a leader. Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing that? And then how do you help others not to, um, you know, say, here are my strengths, but to help them leverage you in the way that those are your strengths and they can get the best of you at all times and also know where you may have some, you know, I wouldn't call them weaknesses, just areas that you haven't focused on, um, you know, to develop them into strengths and then, and then bring other people in, you know, the, the identification of, of your strengths and how you share those. How do you, how do you go through that process? You know, it, it's an interesting process because it, it takes you really taking a step back from yourself and, um, and looking at yourself in a way that is, 
fearful, right? <laughs> like it's being yeah. honest with yourself. I mean, for me, I've, I've always found it fascinating, the understanding of self and, you know, it was like early ticking Myers and Briggs test and what kind of personality do I have? And how do these personalities match with other types of personalities? And what kind of friends, like would I get along best with? Like, it was just a fascinating, sociology is a fascinating thing to me in terms yeah. of people and, and how we engage. So for myself personally, that was something that I found was like, really digging deep into my personality, um, but also being okay with asking questions. You know, I um, was at a company and was leading HR and we instituted 360 degree um, reviews for employees. And there were a lot of people that didn't want to do that because they didn't want to. I remember those. (laughs) (laughs) Those are never fun. Self-evaluation. Okay. I'm great. Yeah, and hearing what other people say about you. But but I mean, it is that awareness because we go off thinking that we're one way and I've heard things from people and I was like, oh, yeah, I could see that about myself and I could see how that in this position as a leader, maybe I used, I mean, I'm a direct person. You have to be cautious with being direct in a way that, you know, it's like black and white. Like I should tell you that that is this way and not everybody operates like that. And so it, for me, having kind of the data with, like I said, some of these personality tests was helpful to look at myself and understand myself and the ways that worked. And then, and then asking people like really being okay with getting the type of feedback, whether it was from friends or, or family and especially colleagues to say, okay, so how do I actually operate uh, in this space? And let me think about the ways that I can continue to grow myself. Are these personality traits I need to kind of overcome are these things that I can hard kind of hardwired built into me or are they things that maybe are flexible and I think as leaders it is important to think about how our personalities match with other people even as we think to bring on supporting people onto our team where there's just personalities that don't match and and you start to see that play out in terms of the disagreements and and conflict that happens at the higher levels. Yeah, it's a really interesting perspective, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, e- even those personality tests only tell us something about <laughs> us, and, and it shifts. You know, some of them have, you know, in, in your normal state, you're this personality type. In a kind of confrontational state, you're this one. And I, don't, I don't remember if that's the My- Myers-Briggs or another one. But even that, you know, it's, it's, it's really fluid. Mm-hmm. You know, we can say we're a type. We can say we're a sign, and that sign means we're more in touch with something versus something else. But it really isn't in, in, you know, different stages, different parts of the day, possibly mm-hmm. different parts, whether we're traveling or at home, we have different ways of dealing. You know, it's like a turtle's getting ready to fight. Well, it pulls its head into its shell and it goes and rams its shell. You know, it's just it's changing its environment around it in order to to do something. And, and we do that as humans all the time. And it's, it's interesting to think about that in a, in a position of leadership is to know when to let certain things come out personality types like hey I don't like your shirt well that may offend someone right. like, that's not the best opener of a conversation and and just being thoughtful around those word choices and timing of uh, conversation so with um, you know with that and, and going through that have you worked with your team is that part of your understanding to create that environment of collaboration as everyone talks through things that they know about themselves or you know, if you're not doing a formal 360 at a large 10,000 person firm, what are you doing with your co-founders and your, your five person team or your, your 10 person team with consultants? Do you go through that exercise at all? You know, talking about a transparency, that's, right. <laughs> that's being fully open and vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we haven't gone through like more formal processes, but you know, and, and us all coming together is creating um, open dialogue and communication to to be okay saying, hey, that the way you did that, I didn't like it or this type of feedback that you're doing. And so in a smaller team, I mean, I, I do think and I have plans actually for us to at the beginning of next year of Institute, like not a full 360, but kind of doing some of this reverse feedback for each of the founding members with the advisors um, and rest of teammates that we work with, because I do think having that insight is important. We just haven't had the chance to like sit down. I probably wished I had done it, you know, started that from the beginning in hindsight, I think having those types of things is important, but what we've done at least up to this point is just had really open dialogue and communication 
around being able to go to each other and talk about things um, that are impacting each other, ways that we've operated that, that don't necessarily work. And what the outside advisor is also trying to create that dialogue too of like, hey, if you see something that I'm doing that does that isn't great or could be better, please come tell me because I don't, I don't know what I always don't know. And if I'm stuck in my ways, I may not understand a different way of being. So it, it is those even saying that out loud to somebody, I think is the start of the process. If you don't have, you know, the capabilities to institute more formal processes around it. Yeah. At least have the open dialogue, the conversation and, you know, to your point earlier, be open to it, you know, be open to hearing things that may be hard to hear and, and maybe are things that you need to, step back and understand better because we're not always that self-aware yeah. and sometimes that mirror is not right there for us to to check ourselves so it's, it's good to have someone that you trust who you care about both in your professional space obviously but also in your personal life that can do that because it, it does very much impact everything you do um, yeah. so I, I think it's great that you share that what is your philosophy or what is your approach to life Cause I'm, I'm hearing a lot of these things come out of the conversation, but do you have, you know, can you say like, here's how I live my life and, and here's my approach to it. I mean, I, I don't know. I think it really does. Like my approach, I guess, is just trying to be the best person that I can be and, yeah. and, and push myself to achieve whatever it is that I can accomplish. And that's, you know, whether it be like being a mom for my son, I mean, I've read like, you know, every parenting book, and like, like <laughs> knowledge seeker, I guess, and taking into consideration that there's not one way ever of doing things, because my son ends up having, being on the spectrum and having severe anxiety and different than I would have anticipated in terms of the needs that he has and how I could take care of him. But my overall philosophy is just being the best person I can be. And, and being a trustworthy person. Like I want to be known, you know, when I die, like this is somebody that actually cared about people that was kind, that was honest, that was trustworthy. And, and whatever she did, she put her heart into it. Like that would be my <laughs> ideal saying. Um, but like I said, it's a responsibility I have. I carry the names of my ancestors, which are important to me. I carry my family now and my son and my mom and my grandma and my siblings. I I carry a responsibility that I that I want that to mean something to the future generations. When my son talks to his grandkids about me, I want it to be inspiring to, to them to hear like this is what how we could go about living our lives. I don't need a lot of fame and fortune. I just want to know at the end of the day, the people that were around me knew that I was a good person at the end of the day. It's a very beautiful thing to hear. And, and um, I hope that imparts itself and many others and, and they can ground themselves in those things that matter most. And, and um, you know, I think it's really important that we as business leaders, as well as community members and, and leaders of a family um, in which businesses invariably are as well, have that presence to, to say, I really just want to be a good person, you know, a good human being and what that means to Every one of us is slightly different, but hopefully it's within the same realm of what being kind means and what being caring means and what providing for someone actually means and, you know, how that influences us. And, and obviously there's a, a very rich history of, of influence in your very immediate family and, and the generations, as well as those that are well before you and also those that come well after you. And there's a responsibility there that you seem to bear. And, and um, it's a very... Uh, important one that we all have to, to take seriously. Um, how do you protect that? You know, I've, I've been in situations where I've exposed my name uh, mm -hmm. that I've tried to protect in many ways that you have and, and honoring my grandfather and my father and honoring my grandmothers and my, and my mother and, and, you know, our, our name and, and our core values as a family in many ways and passed that on. And I've had others that I've brought into my life um, tarnish that in my view. And, you know, sometimes we create professional relationships that aren't necessarily in our best interest, but we always can't avoid that. You know, we have to go into things being trusting of others and because otherwise we wouldn't be open-minded. Um, but when that happens and it is very important to you, and, and obviously the 
the approach to your life is that, how do you protect yourself from those that may not be as kind and caring and giving as you are, um, but that come into this environment that you're, you're trying to create a brand and an experience for people to, to accept that and learn that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging, right? Because like you said, we're trying to do the best that we can do. And, and there's people that come from all different experiences and all different mindsets that are not necessarily there. I've had that happen to me. I've, I've had people use my name in ways that I, you know, later found out like, why were you putting my name in that specific uh, space? But, um, but it, I think, you know, it, it's two things. It's also understanding that people do come from different places and having some acceptance that, that people are going to act different and behave different for all sorts of reasons. And a lot of it's fear and shame and childhood experiences and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So it's having grace a little bit for those experiences to say, you know, I'm not going to let what you are as a person impact me as a person and, and being able to, I don't, you don't want to be guarded, but almost have like a protection layer around yourself, even your company, right? Because there's going to be experiences where your company gets hit and people are going to say bad things. I mean, you hope not, but but they might about your company or your products or your services where you're like, gosh, we're really just doing the best that we can as a company. And so having almost like grace and space for those people that are going to, because they're going to, it's inevitable. That's just human nature to to have a mix of different types of personalities Uh, and being grounded within yourself of having opportunities to like breathe and let go of things when they happen. So, you know, I mean, we all could sit with these heavy burdens of these bad experiences that are happening to us, but how do we process them and let them go so they don't change us and we don't become hard or fearful or shame, just like these other people are operating. It's not easy though. I mean, there's times I've, gone to bed and like crying, you know, like what's happening or, or sit in my, you know, in my office and like, I don't understand. I don't understand why someone would have done this and why are they saying this about me or my family or siblings and, or about us as a company. Like we're not just this company trying to only do this or something like that, but it's, it's almost like, I think as leaders or just as people, it's being able to hold that space. I do a lot of journaling and letting emotions go and, And like I said, and then just compassion of understanding that there's people that we just don't know why they even operate the way they're operating and just not to take it so personally. I mean, there are bad people out there, obviously, with bad intentions also. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it goes back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. And and you'd mentioned as well in the um, brand trust and that relationship with uh, a customer. And, And really being vulnerable to that, but also being open to if a customer gives you feedback mm-hmm. may not be a personal attack. It may be, you know, something that impacted them and making sure that your name not only stands for someone who says we're the best, but someone who, and, and a brand who says, well, okay, well, let's just say we are the best, but what happened to you wasn't the best. So how do we change that? Right. This mindset of hospitality, your experience was not what it should have been. How do we change that for you and make it better for you next time? Um, and I think a lot of brands get that wrong, but it, it sounds like you embed that into your brand ethos, into that brand trust relationship with the customer. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit when you do get feedback from your customers that isn't the best? Yeah, and it's going to happen, right? I mean, it's going to happen, especially as a product company. People are going to take our products and they're not going to work the way they expected them to work. It's going to work if you're a service company and you're not going to provide exactly the service that people expected you to, um, to, and, but it's just a matter of really having, I think for me, a compassion and, and how can we help solve this for you, right? Like if the, our products don't work for you, let's see if we can try to make them work. Maybe it's dosing, maybe it's how you use it. And still at the end of the day, it, it, they just might not work or, it's not exactly the experience that somebody wanted. So how do you put in place you know, customer satisfaction guarantees and, and things like that to, to be able to manage those conversations? Some people you can't win. I've been around some people that are so negative. I mean, you know, we've all been around them and no matter what you say, no matter what you do, maybe they're just having a bad day. I want to take it out on you and you're the product that they use today or service and 
there's just no winning in those ways, but you can win in terms of how do you treat a person, right? How do you, how do you have respect for them still, even knowing that at the end of the day, they, they might write a bad review about you, but they can't write a bad review about the way you manage that experience for them and the way that you handle that as a company. And that's something I think people forget about sometimes of the value and importance of good quality customer service and just care for each other as humans to recognize that. Yeah, and that's always, to me, the, the most important response is, is not whether or not someone did or did not like something. It's, it's how you treated them in the process of, you know, communicating with them and trying to resolve a situation, you know, and, and some of those customers actually become the most vocal proponents of mm -hmm. your brand once you have that experience with them. You know, they, they really actually create that that one-on-one -on -one connection, say, well, you know, I had a bad experience, but the way they handled this was so great. You know, maybe that product didn't work for me, but maybe it works for someone else. And I trust that that's really their intent. Mm -hmm. You know, their intent is to help. And like we said, not everything helps everyone the same. For some person, it might be five milligrams of this medicine. For someone, it might be 20 milligrams of that medicine. And that's a process of trial and error. But if you're open to saying, well, it didn't work for me, but it could work for someone else. And you have that customer's trust, even if they're not your customer, they're a brand ambassador. And, and that's a great way that you share is that process, how you treat them, how you respect them, how you communicate to them is really important. Um, what, what would you say is the advice you would give yourself of the, the person you were 10 years ago to, to get to the person you are today? Um, thinking about what advice do you want to give to the person you are 10 years from now? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think for me, just having, I don't know, I, I'm trying to, I was, somebody just asked me a very similar question. I was writing a, for an article and, and I was thinking about it where I was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was like, I'm unstoppable. I was, you know, at the kind of like trajectory of moving into executive management and my career. And I had always achieved whatever I put my mind to, like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be this. And I think it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to take on new challenges. I, you know, I, I treaded cautiously into moving on into entrepreneurship because it's like, I, I had my plan. I, I was young. I wanted to be an astronaut. I ended up going, working at JPL as an intern. Like I had, I had my whole life planned out since I was like five, like I'm going to have kids at this age. <laughs> this is how I know success is going to happen for me. And 10 years ago, I was still along that mindset. But what happened is to my son, you know, that changed with some of the needs he had moving into entrepreneurship, recognizing that like, there's something more I feel like I can accomplish. But it was met with a lot of hesitation internally for myself with a lot of fear of, can I do this on my own? Can I, can I manage things that I, that life brings that are different, right? Like, you can't anticipate everything that's going to happen and just be open to what unfolds in front of you. And, and, and shift and pivot and make better decisions at that point, which I had seen before in tech and e-commerce companies. And I was like, all right, we got to pivot. We got to do this. But then myself, I was like, this is my path and this is where I'm going and I'm not going to pivot from what my ultimate goals are. They're so different now. 10 years ago is a very different picture of my life than where I'm at today. And I think going forward in, in 10 more years would would be the same thing of like, just be, be open to what might come. We'd ha we have no control over so many situations in our life and our business, financially, politically, as much as we can, there's some control, but there's only so much in some of those. And so, yeah, that would be the thing is just be open to what might be different than you anticipate and be really flexible with how you perceive that opportunity in front of you to move forward. Well, thank you for that advice. I think it's, it's sage advice and, and certainly um, something that we can all take to heart. So appreciate you, you sharing a lot of what you've been, um, you know, building you know, with Element Apothic, which is very clearly a, um, uh, an expression of who you are as a person, who your family is, uh, the experiences that they have, that they've helped people with and help to heal people with and, and your intention to help share that. Is there any other advice you think our audience, um, our listeners would be interested in who are entrepreneurs starting something new, changing a career from this professional path 
corporate environment to entrepreneurship. You know, that, that's a big leap that takes a lot of risk and, and a lot of perseverance to maybe get somewhere that gives you a sustainable lifestyle. If not, you know, what everyone thinks is success in this financial return, which not everyone's looking for necessarily, but is, is there anything else that you'd like to share um, based on your experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, like, really think about it as you make that transition and, and, and plan for it, because it's life changing in terms of responsibility. It's demanding in terms of, of responsibility. You know, my day doesn't end when it used to at seven or eight o'clock at night when I walked out of the office. My, my life evolved around, you know, building this business and leading this. It's a responsibility that you'll start to feel when you have people that are counting on you to now pay their bills and make their, you know, make ends meet for their side and their families, it's a responsibility and that you've put so much effort into it. So like, don't, don't take it lightly, but don't be fearful of it. Also, it's just a matter of really being um, flexible with kind of what's ahead of you planning financially. Cause it takes for me, I mean, it takes longer to build up to, a space where you're like, okay, I'm financially where I used to be. And that might take a long time to get there as well. And um, being willing to make sacrifices to be able to achieve something that's bigger for me than I could have ever accomplished and continuing to build into that kind of executive management role that I was hoping um, to achieve in corporate positions. Um, and the other thing too, though, is like, don't be afraid of success also. And I talk a lot about, you know, it's our responsibility to give back and create good products, but, you know, to also grow a company, to think about your financial responsibility to grow that company from investors that are putting money in you, from the employees that are counting on you, like to have a sound business isn't just about doing good. It's about also doing good in many ways, including having a financially sound business. And so that's something that, that we're working hard to achieve because we have the, the good, the products are great, but like now we have to think about the structures to actually build revenue and to grow companies. And I don't want to, you know, one day have our investors lose money. These are people that trusted us to build this business. And so we have a responsibility. And, and I think that, you know, it's a tough balance, right? Because people are like, oh, if a company makes a lot of money, maybe they don't care about people. It's, it's trying to find that fine line also. And I think we all as entrepreneurs have a responsibility, especially in the cannabis space, because these products really do help people. And a lot of us are in it for a good purpose of being okay with what success also might mean from a financial perspective as well. Well, Davina, thank you very much for your time, for all that you're putting out in the world with Element Apothic and best of luck for your continued growth. And we'd love to have you back to hear some of that personal and professional growth in the future. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Adeptus On Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.